Hello. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Christian Sandvig, and I'm here to introduce the final lecture in the Year of Social Media Lecture Series. Um, to start, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this event. Our sponsors are the Illinois Informatics Institute, the Coordinated Science Laboratory, where you're sitting now, and the College of Media. Um, let me introduce our guest, David Weinberger. Um, David has, no, no clapping yet, I have to tell you about him. I, I admire the enthusiasm, though. Um, so David Weinberger has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Toronto. Um, he has an incredible career. He has been a vice president of strategic marketing at uh, Interleaf uh, and uh, elsewhere. He's also consulted widely in industry for companies like uh, Sun, Yahoo, and Microsoft. Um, he is a New York Times best-selling author. Um, he uh, co-authored the Clue Train Manifesto, among his other books, which include uh, Small Pieces Loosely Joined, Everything is Miscellaneous, and he's working on a forthcoming book, uh, which I believe is, oh, it's there, uh, Too Big to Know, due out in 2012. Yeah, okay, he's, he's not sure. Um, he's a senior researcher at the Berkman Center for uh, Internet and Society, and he co-directs the Harvard Library's Innovation Lab. And in 2010, he became a Franklin Fellow of the United States Department of State. Um, please join me in welcoming our speaker for today, David Weinberger. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian, and thank you for your hospitality. And, and, and Lisa, it's great to be here. Uh, it's the last in the lecture series, so of course I am going to sum up and wrap up the entire topic, in the, and that will be everything you need to know about social media all in one. Unfortunately, I'm not doing that, so instead I'm going to, um, I, mean, I would love to be able to do that, but <clears throat> I'm going to talk about um, what is happening to knowledge on the internet. Um, so, uh, you know, a hyperlink is a little tiny thing. It's a very minimal sort of technology taken on itself. It doesn't get much simpler than that. And yet, s uh, hyperlinks, the, the cumulative power of, I guess, trillions at this point of hyperlinks, ha have had astonishing effects. So that the most important, most stable, secure, time-honored institutions that we have at just the touch of a hyperlink have dissolved. The, the encyclopedias have transformed, obviously. Um, newspapers have become uh, disaggregated and then re-aggregated on multiple sites, and the, we all know about the problems with the, news, the newspaper industry is going through. The recording industry, I don't even have to begin to tell you about. We know what happened there. And all because of a little tiny piece of technology, a little tiny hyperlink, and these things that we thought were so stable, so important, foundation, foundational bedrock, just you know, gone or disappearing, vanishing, if they're not quite gone yet. It's really fairly amazing. We had no idea that our institutions were so fragile that they would shatter at the touch of a little hyperlink. So I want to look at one particular institution, that of knowledge, which has the same sort of solidity and gravity and importance in our culture as the others and um, look at some of the things that are happening to knowledge um, thanks to the internet, as knowledge moves onto the internet. I'm going to be nowhere near comprehensive or conclusive about this. So, so first, just level setting. Um, we've had a very firm idea in our culture over the past 2,500 years of what knowledge is. It has certain characteristics that we're very comfortable with that we expect that are well well set in our, in our minds, an image of knowledge. And for example, um, knowledge is uh, hard won. It's not easy to gain knowledge. That's in part because of another characteristic, namely that, that knowledge is of things that are not as they seem. You have to go past appearances. The sun looks like it's circling the earth, but the knowledge says no, it's not. And it's only because the world is not exactly as it seems that we've had to worry about knowledge. You've had to pursue knowledge. So knowledge is something that generally is under the surface. And it's not just a sort of big heaping pile of knowledge. It rather goes together in a very orderly way, uh, in ways that we have pursued. We've pursued the order of knowledge very explicitly for a couple thousand years. It was tremendously important to us. It was the reflection of how God himself thought about the world. And you don't know what a thing is until you know where it is in this 
in this perfect order, this beautiful order as well. Knowledge has been that which is settled, that which we have agreed about. When we are disagreeing about a topic, when there's widespread disagreement about it, we say, well, we don't know yet. It's only once disagreement has been driven out, marginalized, that we then say, yes, we know this. This is settled. What is knowledge is what is settled and written down and all reasonable people agree to. This has given rise to a hope that was well expressed by Senator Moynihan that uh, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, not his own facts. And we, I, this is phrases turning up more and more in it. it. It expresses an idea about how knowledge works, but it also expresses um, a certain view of, uh, of how we can come to agreement, a promise of knowledge. And frequently, it, it actually may sound a little bit more like this. But the promise of knowledge is, in fact, that we will all be able to get along, we'll be able to agree come to agreement if we just work at it hard enough, because there is only one knowledge. We don't even have a plural for it. There's one knowledge. If we all, it, it's the, that about which we can all agree, that, that which is, will rescue us from the many disputes and disagreements that we poor humans um, have with one another. And so there's comfort in um, Senator Moynihan's phrase, which is why I think we keep hearing it over and over these days. There's comfort in it. And finally, our image of knowledge says, well, knowledge is possible. Uh, it's a very basic thing, of course, but we, yeah, knowledge is possible. We can take what we know, we can systematize it, we can put it in a place, we can make that relatively public in the modern age, we can make it publicly accessible. It fits into a building the size of a library. Not all of it, of course, but enough of it for it to be, the, to make the project of the library seem plausible, the gathering of knowledge. Knowledge is, is possible. So this vision of knowledge, this set of assumptions about knowledge, um, springs to a large degree, for, I believe, from the fact that we've known for a long time that our skulls are tiny. Compared to what we need to know, our skulls are little, tiny, pathetic things, and they don't get any bigger. They don't scale. And so our basic strategy has been, in the West, in our culture, for the past 2,500 years or so, the basic strategy has been to know the world by reducing what there is to know so that our poor, pathetic skulls, our brains, can manage it. So we have had a set of strategies that have worked incredibly well. We are the dominant species on the planet, after all. A set of strategies that manage this great, uh, overwhelming abundance of what there is to know by reducing it, including one prominent way, by breaking the world off into brain-sized chunks, and then allowing and enabling experts to master those chunks. And then we can call upon those experts when we have a question, whether in person or uh, through a book, where they've externalized their knowledge, and we can, we can get a response. And when we get our response, because the person is an expert, we're done. We, we've got our answer. We can move on. This knowledge, this very successful strategy of knowledge, has been primarily about putting in a set of stopping points so that we don't have to keep on asking the same questions. You ask the expert, what is the atomic weight of carbon? Or you look it up in the expert's book, and she tells you, and now you can just move on. And it's, <coughs> excuse me, very efficient. <coughs> Pardon me, I have some, I'm catching a cold. So, <coughs> so I'm going to have to do that more often than I want to. So <coughs> we have knowledge as a series of stopping points with credentials as a secondary system of knowledge, which are also a series of stopping points. So I don't believe that you got the, the atomic weight of carbon right, when the expert can say, well, you know, I have a degree in chemistry from, oh, okay, sorry, I didn't know. I didn't know you were an expert. Credentialing system is also part of a series of stopping points. We structured knowledge that way because it's hugely, hugely efficient to do. It's highly inefficient to have to go into your backyard and repeat the carbon weight experiment every time you want to know. So. Uh, so we, we've internalized this as if the, that these are properties of knowledge itself, but in fact it's the properties of, of the medium of knowledge, which has been paper, parchment before that, but it's writing things down. And it, it, I think it's important to realize just how deeply the nature of paper and of books has shaped our idea of what knowledge is. That this is not a natural idea of knowledge, rather it's because knowledge has been preserved and communicated through books that we have this view of knowledge, that it breaks up, for example, into book-sized chunks. You write, 
Um, Books fundamentally are, are, are disconnected medium. Right? That's maybe the most important thing about them. It, so you have to try to contain within them everything that the reader needs. It's only polite. You'll only succeed with the reader if the reader can go from the beginning to the end and have a complete experience. So you put in footnotes, of course, which link out, but nobody follows the footnotes. It's too hard. You have to sort of hop on a bus, go to a city, find the, the library, crawl through the stacks and hope that they have a copy of the book and that the book is in. So that's hugely expensive. And so we don't do it except in very special circumstances. Uh, for example, we're one of the handful of scholars in the same area. And even then, generally, the very small percentage of footnotes we actually follow. Rather, footnotes are stopping points. I, why, does the, why does the author say this? I don't think, oh, I see why. There's the, there's the footnote, and you stop. <coughs> The nature of books, uh, of knowledge, has been dictated to a large degree by, there's plenty of seats. Or, you know, it's, I am not in charge of whether you want to stand or sit, so. Um, <laughs> um, so the breaking up of knowledge into topics that happen to be book length is not an accident. It's because of this disconnectedness of books that we have to have the, the whole experience fit within, within a volume. <clears throat> so much of uh, books have functioned as stopping points because that's just the nature of the medium. Paper is very, very disconnected. It connects to other sheets of paper that abound within it, but it is hugely disconnected from all the other pieces of paper and pieces of knowledge. So obviously now we have a, a new medium for knowledge. Um, and you can think about, well, I'm not sure this is helpful, but I'll say it anyway, you can think about um, knowledge as being a new type of punctuation. Where the old type of punctuation tells you generally where to stop, while links are a type of punctuation that tell you how to continue. In fact, not just how to, but you make the smallest possible human motion, which I believe is that. I'll do it again in case you can't see it in the back. It's that. And now you are at the next source. This is the map of, of myth that actually takes you where you want to go, not just map it. So um, we now have a medium that is, is characterized profoundly by connectedness. The irony is that as soon as you have that type of medium, um, a, a highly connected medium, things fall apart. Because you don't have to hold them together. The, connect, the links can hold them together. So everything starts to fall apart as soon as we have this medium of connectedness. And that's much of what we're seeing now. And it's behind the three effects on knowledge that I want to talk about today. <clears throat> so Clay Shirky, of course. Uh, no talk is complete without the reference to Clay Shirky. Um, and because he's right, as he, you know, he so frequently is. He, uh, Clay recently said a few months ago, there's no such thing as information overload. There's only filter failure. And, and in, which is a brilliant statement, and I think completely right. And in an odd way, I think that he was trying to give some comfort, find some continuity um, to those who are distraught by the information overload today that we hear so much about. Yeah, but it was always like that. Um, so Clay takes it back to Gutenberg. You can easily go back further than that. There's a nice quote from Seneca uh, uh, decrying the, too many books in the world that nobody's, nobody's ever going to be able to read them all. This, he's right. We've always had. We've always gone through periods of feeling information overload um, it's, uh, when, in fact, it's only filter failure. There is something different, however, now, because the nature of, of filters has changed as they've become digital filters. Physical filters uh, work by separating things physically. You make two piles. Where there was one, now you have two, and you get rid of one of the piles because it's not interesting. It's a physical separation. So, um, if you are on the acquisitions committee of your local library, you make decisions about which books to, um, you're going to uh, bring in. But nobody sees all of the hypothetical truckloads of books that you did not accept. They don't see these trucks of rejected books backing away from the library in a long, continuous stream. They only see the handful of new books that are put out on the new bookshelf, and they're very happy to see that. So the, the filters were, in, the, in a physical world, frequently are hidden. You don't see what's been rejected. But when we filter on the web, we do something different. We don't so much, uh, we don't um, reject the big piles of stuff 
Rather, we simply filter some other things forward. The things that we reject that get filtered out don't go away. They're still there. They're still available. And we're still aware of them. They're not hidden from us at all. And so all that we're doing when we filter something is on the web is we're reducing the number of clicks that it takes to get there. Right? So I, I make my list of the top 10 airplane movies of the 1970s. And now you can, I've shortened the number of clicks to air, airplane, airport 95, uh, 75, excuse me, wonderful movie, cannot be missed, indistinguishable from its parody. Nevertheless, so I, I've shortened the number of clicks it takes you to get there, because now you just go once. But all the other movies that didn't make my list are still totally available to you. All, the, all of it's totally available to you and might well show up on somebody else's top 10 list or show up in a, in a Google search or somebody might email it to you or blog it or whatever. Even if it shows up as the five millionth hit at Google, somebody might still, there are other ways of getting the information. Somebody might mail it to you. So all that we do when we filter on the net is reduce the number of clicks. We don't actually remove any material. It's all still there. So when you go to Google and you, you search on information overload, you get three million hits. They're very proud. The search engines are very proud to tell you exactly how much you're not seeing. They're not trying to hide it. They, they have financial, commercial reasons to boast about it. So it's constantly being put in our face that there's so much there. It is in the financial interest of, in, so we are constantly made aware of what used to be hidden from us. Um, so filters work differently. And one of the results of that is I think that uh, curation also now is beginning to work quite differently. So it used to be that there was, and there still is of course, tremendous value in curating collections, but there's even greater value in building collections that are fundamentally uncurated. Um, so include everything. It turns out it's often more expensive to delete things these days. That's why our, our um, own photo folders on our hard drives are filled with, with DSC 107932.jpg. And we have no idea what it is, but we dumped it onto our hard drive. And it just take too, takes too much work to go through and delete, so we just keep them all. It, it's cheaper often to include than to go through and delete. But there's great value in including everything. or uh, I guess I should put scare quotes around everything, but it's as close to everything as you can practically get. Because the alternative is that you have to make decisions as a curator about what is going to be interesting and useful and important to your users. And you'll make good decisions because you're good curators, but nobody can anticipate what's going to be interesting to everybody else. You just cannot do it. So if you are curating a news collection, you are very likely you would exclude the Lindsay Lohan, Britney Spears, gossipy, trashy stuff, properly so, it's not really news, et cetera. And then you would then have killed the primary research materials for this conference and studying the effect of celebrity, media celebrity on women. You were right. But you couldn't know. You couldn't possibly anticipate what everybody's use is. And second of all, you can't anticipate history. So if you were curating in, say, 2007, you undoubtedly would not have included the meetings from the li public library in Wasilla because you couldn't anticipate this. History is just funny that way. You can't anticipate. So uh, yet you have to if you're going to curate. If you include everything, you are taking, you are imposing less of your own inevitable restrictions on the collection. Plus, it's generally cheaper to do that as storage costs go down. But if you include everything, you then also have to provide very strong tools for people to find what they need. So rather than filtering on the way in, you can give them tools to filter on the way out. And one of the ways of reading the history of the web so far is it's a history of the development of increasingly sophisticated and useful and increasingly social tools by which we filter for one another. Um, so providing filtering on the way out makes this useful in ways that you can't anticipate and that makes it more useful. The fact that you can't anticipate it makes it more useful than any anticipated collection. So <clears throat> that's a very um, different approach to way of thinking about knowledge, it's becoming increasingly common on the net and as we hear more and more about data commons and actually whenever, almost whenever the, the word commons is being used, it's being used in some sense like this. It's becoming in many ways the norm for how we deal with knowledge, that we would rather just get it all there and up than carefully curate it. We can curate it afterwards once we have it in a commons. So this is a second effect of knowledge. Uh, um, 
The web only has any interest at all because there are different things on it. It's a web of difference. If, if it were literally the same page over and over again a trillion times, it would be of negative in interest. The web only has interest because of all these differences, because of the nature of links, because, uh, just because of the way that it works, um, that we have anchor text and we have surrounding text. We generally provide some context for why we are sending this uh, a user to another page, which, by the way, is a fundamental act of generosity that is uncommon among um, advertisers, for sure, commercial websites that want to keep you on their site, but also for authors. Where authors generally don't want you hopping out. They count it as a failure if you leave their writing to go to somebody else's. But on the web, writers do that all the time. And not to put in, in links is to look selfish and narcissistic and a, um, a little personal echo chamber. So, we put in links, we explain what the relationship is between what we've written and where we're sending you, and in e every case, just about, we are explaining the difference between that and this. It's a web of differences, that's what gives it its interest. And thus, it's also a web of, it's a web of small differences, it's a web of gigantic disputes and disagreements that will never be resolved. We have no idea in our culture what to do about that fact. It is throwing us absolutely for a loop, turning us inside out. We're getting apoplectic and depressed and enraged and occasionally gleeful about it. We don't know what to do with the presence before us of a linked web of disagreement that never resolves. And so we go through all sorts of fears. And each of these has its value and is right in its own way. But it's a, it's a symptom of our discomfort with, with disagreement. This, we, we've expended a and continue to expend a huge amount of, sort of psychic energy on <coughs> the, the fact that we disagree. In fact, all of these, I think, are exposing a, a truth that we, we've all known for a long time. The net is exposing it, which is a very simple one. We just don't agree about stuff. We never have. And I don't think we ever will. And my evidence for that is all of human history. We've never agreed about anything. And by this, I'm being quite literal. I'm not, I'm not saying um, there are no facts and you can believe what you believe, because that's a pernicious false belief. There are facts. The world is one way, and the world is not another. This is either a pipe or it is not. This may be a little exceptional, but in general, things are either one way or they're another. So I'm not saying, you know, I'm not encouraging you to believe a bunch of crap because you want to believe it. I, I hope I'm not encouraging that. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I, I'm pointing to what I think is an empirical fact, which is we're not all going to agree. Some people are going to be right, but not everybody's going to agree with them. There is no fact on the web that goes uncontested. Every fact has an equal and opposite reaction on the web. It's not always equal, but you know, there is nothing that we all agree about. And as the web becomes more and more cross-cultural, nope, sorry, we've got to give up on that as, as a hope. So it simply is a practical matter. Well, this has, this portends, I'm not sure what the right verb is, but um, manifests a, an important change in the role in, of facts, which I would like to talk about briefly. And facts actually have a relatively brief history in our culture. It was basically a use of facts to settle uh, social disputes. You know, we don't know what to do about welfare or whatever. Let's check the facts. This is the 19th century. Uh, it's a fa the role of facts is very, very new. In fact, um, our, the history of, of knowledge in the West has been primarily, has been focused on, on knowledge of of universals, not on particulars. Particulars are too small to count as real knowledge. Real knowledge, starting from Aristotle on through Bacon, is of universals. And it's actually only with Bacon that facts get any credibility or importance at all as that which grounds the universals. But it's always, knowledge has been about the universals for a very, very long time. And the, the, realm, the regime of facts is, in fact, really pretty new. Couple centuries. So here's Darwin, uh, 1846 to 1854. He studied one factual problem, which is are barnacles crustaceans or mollusks? I thought they were mollusks. Turns out they're crustaceans. It took him seven years of dissecting barnacles to figure this out, to prove it. Two 
very long volumes on the topic that are incredibly boring books. Unlike the one that he wrote just a few years later in 1859, which was, is a great work of literature as well as a great work of science. With two, seven years he came back to his family dinner table smelling of dead seafood in order to establish this single fact. So back then, facts were facts. They were hard won, it took years and years. You had to use little tweezers and magnifying glasses. You had to be a man to, they were manly facts. They were hard won. That's when facts were facts. Now, you know, in the web world, not really so much. So one of the first things that the Obama administration, actually, the first thing that the Obama administration did when President Obama um, uh, took office was to sign a, a, a decree that resulted in, I don't think we call them decrees in America, but you know, um, that resulted in the creation just a few months later of data.gov, which I'm sure as you know, uh, the executive branch agencies are required to put all their public data, which is to say all of their data, that, uh, outside of confidential stuff or security stuff, to make it public. And to do so, and I think this was a wise decision, um, in raw form. So rather than saying, well, no, no, wait, clean it up, put it into standard formats, check the validity of each of the facts, and then come to us, which would mean it would never happen. Instead, they were told, no, just give us your data, and we'll make it obvious on the site, anybody who wants. And this is raw data, so you know, use it with some caution. But you'll find this inclusiveness you will find more useful than waiting for 20 years for the perfectly cleaned up stuff, which will never happen. So we now have masses and masses of uh, of, of data at data.gov. The data.gov model is spreading around the world and democracies around the world. Uh, this is in many ways the opposite of Darwin's facts. This is every, this is a report on tire pressure for every model the EPA tested under, you know, it, it's just everything bundled, put together, thrown out. Not hard one. <laughs> we have a superabundance of it, of course. In fact, we now have disciplines and I, just pray to God that there is no systems biologist here to contradict me. Any systems biologists here? Excellent. Okay, so as, um, in my understanding, a systems biology does thing. Uh, for example, looks at the um, interaction of, of chemicals across a cell wall, and views it in terms of messaging. The, the the messaging systems are so complex and so full of cascades that human beings cannot understand them. You can feed all the data into a computer, and a computer will give you the right output. So we are, in that sense, understanding them, but it's too big for the brain. And so here we have a very successful young science that uh, requires the intermediary of a computer, and in some sense cannot be understood, and yet in some sense is understood. It's just too complex. Likewise, there's a um, program called Eureka, spelled with a Q for trademarking reasons, I assume, that uh, takes large masses of data, looks at them, and tries to derive, and apparently quite successfully, derives relationships and, and equations, which work, but which humans may not understand. So we are in a new realm of understanding that is larger than the human brain, and this is founded upon facts that are so massive um, and the opposite of hard one carefully winnowed down. There's one other type of, well, there's one other type of fact that I want to talk about briefly. Does anybody here know the site hunch.com? So a handful of people. So hunch is a site where you input information about you and then you can ask it a question like what movie do I want to see tonight or what type of food or what type of wedding present should I give my niece? And it will uh, look across statistically at everybody else and come up with suggestions. And it can be pretty accurate. It's surprisingly accurate, especially since the sort of questions that it asks you are not the profile questions that you're used to. What food do you like or what's your political party? Instead, it's a series of, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of, of questions, uh, most of them at this point designed or input by other users, that have no relationship to anything. Right? So they will ask you, do you know how to bow tie a bow tie? No, I do not. Uh, do you get a little thrill out of visiting the hardware store? A little bit. I have to admit, I get, a, I get a little thrill out of visiting a hardware store. Have you ever physically touched a dolphin? I have not. No, I have not. So we've just established three facts about me. Don't know how to tie a bow tie, get a little thrill from a hardware store, never touched a dolphin. They're, these are facts. These are trivial, unimportant, weird-ass facts, but they're facts. And you can imagine an endless, literally a, a, an infinite number of these facts that, that that Hunch might ask, have you ever physically touched a green dolphin, a young dolphin, a male dolphin, a female dolphin? 
just on dolphins, you could get pretty close to infinity. There's an infinite number of facts that this site is gathering about us, and voluntarily, of course, that, are, that didn't exist before they asked. I don't, it's a, did I ever touch a plaid dolphin? I mean, that's sort of a fact that I haven't, but it's not, it's one that only exists once somebody asks me that. It's a very strange sort of fact, and yet it has utility, because when I ask about wedding gifts, it actually comes up with some pretty good suggestions. Hunch has no theory of human psychology. It has no theory about why people who have not touched dolphins but, and don't know how to tie a bow tie might like to give a year of seeds as a, it has, and it purposefully has no model. They don't want one. They don't have, they, all they have are statistical correlations among weird ass facts, but it works. This is a very, compare this to Darwin, one of Darwin's facts, it, almost no relationship. There's almost no relationship. But these facts sort of work in their own way. So facts no longer are uh, indisputable nuggets that go together to create a picture of the world. There are way too many other sorts of facts for that. And furthermore, I probably should point out, and so we, like to, we still like to think that facts are the bedrock, and I believe in facts, I just don't think that practically they're going to be the bedrock for this, the things we argue about. We should, I should probably point out that this statement by Senator Moynihan that gives us some comfort, we can't even attribute it to him. Nobody knows who said it. Um, it might have been him, it may, it may have been him, not quite this. We don't know. So even that is up in dispute. So if facts are undergoing this sort of change, then what do we do? And I, I'm only going to point to two things really quickly because I don't pretend to have answers to these sorts of things. But I do want to um, uh, uh, make it clear that this is not an inactive question. We have a lot. We're responding to this, this state of affairs very rapidly. Um, and with some interesting things. Uh, one is, again, I'm going to be very, very brief about this, but one is the rise of namespaces as a way of dealing with facts uh, with worldviews that are in dispute, ways of organizing and categorizing things, of talking about things that are in dispute, but we, we want to be able to maintain the dispute, not have to resolve it, but still allow a type of intellectual collaboration. So a namespace, as I'm sure most of you know, is an is a information space in which things have different names, but you are able to map names to one another with some success. So restaurants do this all the time, but the biology is doing it now increasingly as well. So rather than having to settle unsettleable arguments about the right way of classifying things, what are the right classification schemes? This is a very active dispute among biologists. Instead, you say, well, OK, we can continue to argue, but the important thing is that we can also accept these as different namespaces and do some mapping. So at least we, can, we know we're talking about the same thing. So that's one approach. It's a really fascinating approach to maintaining differences and disputes while still enabling collaboration. Oh, cleared my memory buffer. Damn, <laughs> I'm gonna have to start again. <laughs> Hi, great to be here. So um, the second sort of technique is uh, clearly not just a modern one. We've been doing this for a long time, but I think it's becoming more important and more accepted um, as it becomes clear that we're just not gonna be able to settle things because we disagree about too much, too deeply. Um, so when you go into a bar and you want a beer and they give you a beer and you drink it and it's good, but it's not the best beer you ever had, it's not a perfect beer, you do not slam it down on the bar and say, barkeep, this is not the perfect beer, I, I reject it and march out to the next bar. What you do is say, it's pretty good beer, it's good enough beer. I Thank you, it's delicious, it's good enough. And that's pretty much what's happening to knowledge. That good enough knowledge is good enough, which is to say that we are becoming pragmatists in the philosophical sense about, uh, about truth. So um, we just need things, knowledge to be good enough, and then we can get on with it. The question is, of course, what constitutes good enough? And that's, as we know, entirely cult, uh, context relative. So if you're looking, wondering whether you should buy the new Harry Potter, well, formerly new Harry Potter, and you decide oddly to check the reviews, the 5,600 reviews, it's enough that 84% have given it five stars. So you say, yeah, it's probably worth the 15 bucks, right? It's not a big deal. If you're at eBay and you want to know whether you should bid on this $85,000 airplane, the fact that the seller has only a 90% uh, trust rating 
should scare you off right away. 90% is a terrible trust rating at eBay, and especially for an item of that cost, whereas 84% is good enough at Amazon. And so we all make these decisions. If you have a health problem, we know not to do this. We know not to go to Reddit and try to crowdsource it. Because <laughs> for some it, problems, it might be the case, but for many, just not what you want to do. So we're pr actually pretty good at figuring out what is good enough. Everybody in this room is. I, I suspect that few of us are actually being fooled by outright internet stupidities and scams. But we all correctly worry about our children, and we do need to be educating them um, how to discern what's good enough on the net. Okay, the, <coughs> excuse me, the third area of change, and the, the last that I'll talk about is in long form thought, which is the hard case, right? Because if things are falling apart, if hyperlinks let things fall apart, long form thought um, is a place where the order, the connectedness, is hugely important. That's where the value of long form thought is. It's in the connection among the pieces. So if the, if the digitizing of information is causing it to fall apart and weakening those link, links, then what happens to long form thought? So just to be clear, long form thought at its best, it's, you know, at its peak is a logical argument that um, <clears throat> is extended beyond two premises and a conclusion, but chains that conclusion to the next one and it follows all the way through. And there are works in our literature that, that do this. Spinoza wrote in Ethics that, that did it. Um, and it may not, so it may, it may not be logical uh, deduction that's involved, but still, it's a chain of statements that take you all the way from A, everybody accepts A, all the way to Z, which is the author's radical conclusion that he or she is trying to get you to. So I want to be clear, I'm not saying in the course of this that books are going away. I'm not saying books are going away and that the you know, origin of species is going to be replaced by a Twitter stream. I am saying, however, that I think that long form thought is being dethroned, displaced as the highest, as the pinnacle of human thought. That God thinks in long form and humans, our job is to discern that pattern and that is the pinnacle. To write the book that starts at A, goes all the way to Z. That's the pinnacle. That's what's being dethroned. It doesn't mean it goes away. What it's being replaced by is something that is still under development, has not yet emerged. So it's, it's early to know what it's going to be exactly. But I want to point to three problems with long form writing that really only become trenchant in the age of the web, when we have an alternative to books, which are obviously the, the home of, of the long form. So this is the table of contents of our Origin of Species, which is a magnificent work. The first five chapters are the theory, right? lays it out, beautifully done. Next six chapters are Darwin, 1859, sitting on, in, on Isle of Wight with his family, finally, after many, many, after decades, deciding to write this thing down. He's going through mentally all of the objections that anybody might have to his theory. Right? So it's like, like a little, um, when authors do this, and all authors do this, because you have to anticipate the objections because you don't know what they're going to be because you're writing. You write in public, excuse me, you write in private and then you publish in public, which is sort of backwards. Right? So you have to write in private and anticipate going through the fugue state of what are the worst things that people are going to say to try to make me look foolish and wrong. And then you anticipate them as best you can. Imperfectly, of course, but that's what you do. It is a weird artifact of writing on paper and publishing on paper. Second um, problem with, with long form is that you're trying to get your readers to Z. And so even though you're maybe in a very interesting landscape and there are many, many things that are interesting that they might be distracted by, you view them as distractions. You're only, you want to get them to Z. You, don't, you can't let people wander off to see everything else that's interesting. You need to keep them focused. In, in your writing, to make sure you get them to the all-important Z. And so, in a sense, long-form writing isn't long enough. It forces us to have a focus that is unnatural, to steer away from things that are interesting because they don't get us to Z. And the third problem with long-form is that very, hardly anybody ever gets to Z. There are very few long-form works. I'd be happy, I would actually love to have more examples than the few that I've thought of. Uh, where that actually work, that actually took you all the way, that you started here and you, at the end you were saying, yeah, yeah, that, the author absolutely nailed it. Usually, you know, even something like Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, which is a hugely important work in our culture, a work of genius, 
Nobody gets the Z. Nobody finishes that and says, yes, absolutely. Kant nailed it entirely. I now believe. No, you get to about D and you say, this is really interesting. I can see why it's important in our, in our culture, but he's really, no, he, he's just, he's crazy. You know, it's just too far off. People rarely get all the way to Z. Long form argument is overrated. It usually doesn't work. Sometimes it does. Origin of species. There's some stuff by Peter Singer. Some of it works. Usually it doesn't. So I'm not saying that, therefore, long form is being dethroned, not removed, but dethroned is the pinnacle, and therefore everything's going to be in short little chunks. I think instead, clearly what we're seeing is a type of web form thought emerge. It's this is in chrysalis. We don't know what it's going to be finally. But if Darwin were alive now, it seems pretty clear to me, I suspect to you, that what he would be doing is posting on his blog about, along the way about what he's discovered. He's posting from the Beagle. And uh, for the next 20 years, about what he's doing, what he's thinking, and he would be linked to and linking to a community, a network of people who agree, disagree, hate him, think he's, he's fabulous, think have another idea, agree with this, disagree with that. It would be within a web of ideas. And then when he published his long form work, if that's what he wanted to do, that would go in here. And that also then would be linked and would gain value from all of the links going in and out of it, all the way up to travel agents who see this as a way of selling trips to the Galapagos. It would, the network itself would be the locus of Darwin's knowledge, the knowledge that Darwin was generating. The network that grew up around, the web that grew up around his work would have more value than his work alone. And some of the nodes would be complete crackpots and not worth reading and degrading of the value, but overall being able to see the play of ideas out in public, the objections and, and the elaborations, has more value than just having the book in your hand as a closed volume. It may, in fact, just be that this sort of map is a better map of how the world is than the long form map is. Maybe God doesn't think in long arguments. Maybe God thinks in big, messy webs. And so I started off by asking why is this why have so many of our institutions turned out to be so fragile? And obviously, I'm not going to answer that. Um, <clears throat> every discipline has weighed in properly. This is a big question, the sort of thing you want to have lots of disciplines, each proposing various theories and ideas and each contributing to it, because that's what we need. I want to very briefly suggest one other uh, type of theory, which is um, in part, maybe it's also because there's some truth to, what, to how the web represents the world, so to speak. Maybe there's some truth to the web structure, that in the web we see some things we always knew, but we, we couldn't recognize in the world of print-based knowledge. In fact, the notion, the metaphor of these institutions shattering, I think, even though I introduced it, I think is misleading. They didn't shatter so much as we burst them. We couldn't waste, wait to burst out of them. They were bursting at the seams because there were some truths that they were, not, that they were suppressing, um, because the paper is not very good at it. The world is super abundant with ideas. That's something the paper is not very good at. Paper filters. It has to. Um, it's in dispute. It's at odds. It's inconclusive. It's unsettled. These are all things we've always known about the world. We're never, ever all going to agree. We'd like to hope that we can, but we're never, ever going to. We always give up. Every disagreement we have with somebody that doesn't, doesn't resolve, we say, well, OK, got to move on. We just can't. We're not going to settle it. You're a birther. I'm not. We're not going to settle it, apparently. You're a Nazi. I'm not. We're probably not going to settle it. And furthermore, I'm not really open to your ideas. I'm not open to being changed by you and saying, well, yeah, maybe. There's some validity in what you think, you Nazi prick. It's not going to happen. It's just, it's just, the world isn't like that way, and we've always known it. The, the world is, in fact, not much shaped like a reasonable long-form argument. It's shaped much more like a bursting, contradictory web that will never settle. All of which is fine, except that it means giving up on a, a very old and, and noble dream, which is that w if we get reasonable people together and we sit down, we can all agree on the truth, on the facts, on knowledge, that knowledge is going to save us, that knowledge is going to bring us together in a way that we will be able to live together in truth, in harmony, in the one knowledge. 
But it's not going to happen. Now we know it's not going to happen because we can see the world of disagreement. We cannot avoid the world of disagreement. There is no hope that we are all going to agree. And so the hope, I think, and I have a great deal of hope, is that what, we're gonna ha what we have in common is not a single knowledge. What we have in common is one world, one shared world, about which we disagree and will always disagree. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. What is the role of the university? Well, so in some ways, in some ways, not very different because universities have always been, at least have said that they're about the exploring of ideas and the opening up of, of reasonable disagreement. And all of that's true. There is a, has been a, and I, again, this I think is fairly well recognized, and if you disagree, you'll let me know, but there has been a hidden, say, uh, homogeneity in universities. Uh, uh, um, this is just about inevitable, but there's a, a politics of homogeneity in universities and in every human institution, newspapers as well, where foreign beliefs, foreign to the accepted beliefs, are, are marginalized. Um, there's also been a tradition in universities of relying upon um, traditional uh, curatorial uh, forms of accreditation, you know, uh, publishing in, in, in paper-based peer-reviewed journals where the, um, the fact that there are so few pages in the journal actually counts to the credit of the, of the professor who manages to get published in them. And I believe that we are now seeing, for multiple good reasons, a reaction against um, honoring that type of publishing alone and embracing not only publishing in peer-reviewed open access journals, but in um, the participation of, say, young academics, young at heart anyway, who are living their academic and scholarly lives on the web in conversation, in contention, um, and in, in, with a great deal of generosity uh, of their ideas. That's going to make a lot of trouble for tenuring committees, but they'll have to deal with it. Oh, I'll, yes, sir. So, do you, do you want to comment on the party effect of the, um, the structure of journals should be modified? I mean, should it be made more transparent? Should the review process be more open? Um, um, so, what, what should I, I'm supposed to be repeating questions? Sorry. So, what should the structure of journals be? Yeah, I mean, do, do you think the, the given the kind of nature of internet, the structure of or the review process of journals should be changed, especially in a high impact? All right, so should the structure of the, the review, the structure of reviewing change? Um, be more, made, more made more democratic and the like. So one of the good things about the web is that by lowering the barriers, anybody can publish. And of course, that's one of the bad things about the web, except that the rest of the story is anybody can publish. Um, and we have new techniques for assigning metadata to publications, to expressions so that others can better evaluate them. So it's not really this open field of everybody saying everything equally. Everybody has an equal opportunity to do that, but we have rapidly evolved um, techniques by which we um, help uh, clue other people to the significance of the work. So that means that the ecology for publishing, for ideas, is now way, way, way more open uh, which, which works extremely well so long as the metadata surrounding, uh, attached to the publication is clear. Uh, let me give you an example, because that was an incredibly oblique way of saying something simple. Nature magazine um, c comes with its own metadata, one over the years that you see it in nature, you believe that you believe it, basically. All right, it's well reviewed, well peer reviewed, it's edited, it must be important because nature is very thin. That's metadata that just comes with the physical sub magazine of, of nature. Um, Nature also now has a, a repository, an open access repository that people can publish into, I believe. Um, the metadata there, as at archive.org, is here's a whole bunch of stuff, but you should be aware that it's not reviewed. You should be aware of that. And you may find it incredibly useful. In fact, in fact at archive, much of it may not have, it may be draft material, it may be raw data, data that has not been cleared up. So long as the metadata is there that tells you, the researcher, Here's some data, but it's not cleaned up. Just as at data.gov, it says raw data to let you know, then that becomes incredibly useful. Metadata liberates information. It allows us to build uh, an 
uh, an ecosystem that is far, far richer, far uh, contains materials at various levels of expertise and reliability. So as long as the metadata is there and we are getting better at assigning it, then um, we, can ha we have an ecology in which there are peer-reviewed peer and uh, um, journals um, that are very exclusive in what they accept. We have peer-reviewed journals that are open access and very uh, restrictive in how, how much they publish. Peer-reviewed open access that are very broad, as PLOS One is in what they accept. Right? Anything that passes peer review gets into PLOS One. There's no judgment about whether it's important enough to be published. And so we actually start to get what science, science has always promised us, namely your negative results are also important. Well, they haven't gotten published because there's not enough space on paper, but there is on the web. So the, the, um, the ecosystem breaks open, which means that we also get far better, I think, measures of the importance of works than the impact factor, a two-year uh, trailing indicator that is easy to game, or as we used to say, to corrupt, uh, that, that, uh, far better than that, far more responsive. Mendeley, for example, which uh, is client software that um, lets you manage your library of PDFs and also do some e-reading, uh, they know what people are reading, what they're downloading, and what they're underlining. That's a pretty good indication of impact, a little bit better, I think, than the impact factor gives us. And that's just one example. Sorry, I don't want to plug for Mendeley or anybody in particular. I will try to give shorter answers. I'm sorry, don't ask good questions, yes? There may be some, but I want to dispute eh, everything you said. So the question is, <laughs> um, will we lose the, the meditative, the value of the meditative process of, of going off and writing a long form? Um, so there's still value in that. So I, I'm actually agreeing with you. There's still value in that, and people will continue to do it. Uh, Nicholas Carr, who wrote The, ne the Shallows, um, went off to uh, some place in Colorado in order to focus and to write. And that's great. The book's pretty good. You know. Uh, so people can still do that. When they come back from their sojourn, their work will be thrown onto the web, inevitably. Uh, people will talk about it, even if they don't put it on the web, people will talk about it, as Nicholas Carr's book generated a lot of online controversy. And there's, trim there's more value, there's additive value in having that long-form work done in isolation, meditatively, put onto the web. So ultimately, I think the long-form gains value. People will still write it and gains value from uh, being webified. And second of all, and so this is where I actually do want to push back. Um, yes, there's absolutely, you're talking to a writer who writes, you know, that's what I do. I write by myself and, you know, I'm only a little ashamed of it, but uh, there you go. Um, there's also tremendous value in the other model. So th that model is basically Descartes. But Descartes has to think about the world by sitting in a cabin facing a fire by himself, uninterrupted, so the world will not impede upon him, so he can have his long form thought. And that's great, but you end up with, a, in his case, with what is basically a schizophrenic or psychotic worldview that imagines everything is in his own head. That's where that exercise led. The alternative view is say, well, you know, there's tremendous value in thinking in public. We all do it. We all engage in public because we think there is value in, and I think one of the models that is growing is, in fact, the web one that says the locus of thought is not usually in the individual sitting alone in a fire having semi-psychotic thoughts. It is in the thinker who is thinking in public and in conversation. The locus of value, the knowledge itself, is in the network, not in the individual skull, because skulls don't scale, but networks do. <laughs> yes, we can. What do you think motivates people to uh, share content on social media? What do I think motivates people to share content on social media? Sorry, uh, um, the same set of uh, motivations that people have, which is anything from exhibitionism to good-hearted generosity to selfishness to perverse to whatever. We're human beings, so I don't know. Same as everything else. <laughs> Could I give a broader answer? I study with these people, I, I go to do that, that's the old method of it, but I know how to 
get access into that because they know where the good books are. He acknowledges this network now is out and it's everywhere and it's important and it's disagreeing. How do I, what are the finding tools in order to get in that? How do we? So, so well, if we are in a network where there's uh, all of this, uh, say, randomness, and how do we find our way, way into a topic? We used to have, we used to know what the canon was. So on the one hand, um, the, there are so many new ways of finding the canon of what, what matters. Um, and many of them are totally familiar to all of us. And many of them are um, asking people we know or ask, you know, it's the networking thing. And so we, we all have, or going to a librarian, for example. You know, th those ways still work. Or going to the university and, and asking. Um, we are also able to do things like, or will be able to, once universities pass open syllabi policies, but that's a different hobby horse, be able to see what, what's being taught. I mean, that's a pretty good representation of the canon. It'll be pretty fascinating to see how works ebb and flow, and how trendy they are, how classic they are. Uh, that will be a pretty good guide to the canon as well. But the main problem is that there um, increasingly is not a canon and increasingly, even the topics themselves are becoming much looser edge, which is part of the reason why there's no canon. My concern is it's contextual. I have my links, I have my circle of, of discussions that <coughs> might build this field around something that isn't an island of itself that I don't even realize is a bigger one. Maybe that exists in the current model. We can, we can deviate these tools better somehow because it's online. Well, yeah, I mean, so the cynical view of the current model is that it is, it's building its own islands, it's just declaring them to be the discipline. Uh, and that, in fact, when many people build their own islands, that is, they cluster around themselves, the sorts of things that they find interesting and relevant to the question that they're pursuing, and especially when they're doing that in public and we're able to link these up, that we get a much, much, much messier world, much harder to master, because the boundaries aren't set, but a better reflection of how the world actually works. The world actually does not divide itself, as we've known for generations, does not divide itself up neatly into uh, disciplinary, within disciplinary boundaries. So it, it becomes much messier, harder to accredit. Um, on the other hand, it's also in many ways much easier to find your way into a topic now um, because if you're old enough to remember when there wasn't an internet, it would have meant going to a library and looking something up in an encyclopedia and hoping that there are some see also's. It was not a good system. It was the best we had, but, or asking the library. So I work with librarians, so. And then you, sir. Um, so I like the idea of a public space where we celebrate disagreement rather than trying to Yeah. <laughs> and I can sort of see your point that as we look at the web, it sort of symbolizes, makes visual the fact that we disagree. But I also wonder if that's completely true. And I, I give an example of, you know, during the period of Bush debates, I looked at multiple sites that confirmed that John Turner had, you know, I, I know people who look at multiple sites that tell them that Yeah, so, um, so you are uh, asking the echo chamber, you're raising the echo chamber argument, which is, I think is a very serious and important one. Um, the echo chamber argument, uh, and Cass Sunstein is the guy who's, you know, um, who's currently in the Obama White House, by the way, um, is the most identified with it. And the idea is pretty, pretty powerful, which is that um, human beings tend to stay uh, within their comfort zone. They like to be with people who agree with them when the net, since the net offers so, many, so much freedom about who you're going to associate with, uh, what, where you're going to, what you're going to read and so forth, you will tend to read stuff that confirms, uh, confirms your beliefs, and this, thus an echo chamber, and this will not only reconfirm your beliefs, it will tend to polarize your beliefs. It drives you to the extreme, and there's some evidence that that happens. Uh, <laughs> this is such a difficult and important question, and I don't have an answer to it. Um, all that I would say, I guess I would say two things. First is that it's a way harder question than it, than the more you look at it, the harder the question becomes, the less resolved it becomes. For one thing, you want, it's a comparative question. And this is Johai Benkler's response. He says, well, I'm going to paraphrase pretty grotesquely here, but Benkler's response is, um, compared to what? Uh, the question isn't, is the net perfect? Is, is it better than the old media regime? 
um, are we more open or, or not? Um, and even that, that question is very, very hard. So again, paraphrasing very roughly, uh, Sunstein says, only 15% of politically committed sites have links to opposition sites. And Benkler's response is, I think, exactly right, which is to say, OK, I don't know whether I should be happy about that or sad about that. I could say, wow, 15% actually link out. Or I could say, wow, only 15% link out compared to what? So we're comparing it to the old days of newspaper and Walter Cronkite, where you had one basically a bunch of white guys telling you, here's what's important, here's what you should think. And they did a great job of it. And it was, nevertheless, it was 30 minutes a day. If you watch the TV, it was a single newspaper. And sure, the newspaper told you, gave you stories from around the world that you otherwise would not have sought out or cared about, but you probably skipped them. We don't know how much people read. Yeah, there was an article about something in Africa, but we weren't reading it. We don't know. So doing, doing, the question is a comparative one, and we don't have a baseline. Furthermore, it's very likely, I'm going to guess, based on no data, I, sorry, I, based on no data, that um, frequently uh, when people, that it, it may well vary by topic. So that when I'm searching for political news, I go to, you know, I'm sort of, I'm totally typical. I'm a Boston Jew. You got everything you need to know about me right there. And so, uh, you know, I want to see what uh, a new ruling from the Supreme Court, I don't understand its import. I don't go to a conservative site because it's not telling me. I go to Huffington Post or someplace else that's aligned with me because that is, for me, more useful information. So I'm being bad, bad echo chamber boy when I do that. But maybe I do that for politics and not so much for, uh, for movie reviews or you know, book reviews. We don't know. We don't know whether we should be looking at the links or at the behavior. So this is a huge pile of we don't know. Second point, which is much shorter, fortunately, is in a sense it doesn't matter. We should assume, given human proclivities and neural science, apparently, that um, yes, we are going to do that. We're going to stick with, we're going to reconfirm what we already believe. Confirmation bias, all that's true. We must therefore educate ourselves and our children against that insofar as we can. So in a sense, unanswered questions don't matter because we still have to behave the same way. So would you care to speculate on, let's say the federal government <coughs> continues more or less in the direction you outlined, what do you think the consequences will be for the way we live? The consequences for the way that we live? Well, so I'm an aging hippie, and so I would like to believe that we will get more comfortable with difference and disagreement and learn, recognize that it's not going to go away, therefore we have to share a planet. In fact, I'm an aging hippie, so I think we're probably screwed. Well, I mean, so there are obviously bunches of attempts to come up with systems, some successful, some not so. So the fact-checking sites are actually pretty good and have an effect. I mean, they, they have some, they're not perfect, obviously, but they have some effect. And you're right that it's not simply an internet thing. The mainstream media, I mean, look, sorry if I've told you my politics, so I'll delve into this. And if you don't like the example, it's just an example. But mainstream politics, uh, mainstream media have seen, they cannot resist Bubble Boy. Remember Bubble Boy? 24-hour news cycle on nothing. And they cannot resist Donald Trump. And they cannot resist birther arguments that are currently in a 24-hour cycle about how the birther controversy doesn't matter, is, is irrelevant. Uh, there seem to be some economic things going on that is driving the mainstream media to be as bad as most people think of the internet is. Um, I was at an early conference on blogging and journalism. It was a small, it was, it was a Berkman thing. It was just 30 people, New York Times, a bunch of other people, a bunch of bloggers. Jeff Jarvis was there, who I mentioned on purpose. Um, and uh, the newspapers at this point, there's like 
early 2000s, 2005, mid 2000s, were saying we're, they're disparaging the bloggers. You know, bloggers only care about they're in their pajamas in the parents' house and they're blogging about crap. Um, and this was um, shortly before the Michael Jackson trial, so we can pinpoint this. The newspaper said, yeah, the bloggers are going to be all over this. And I, I believe it was Jarvis who uh, blogs on this topic. I, I, I actually very much like what he has to say in general. He, he said correctly, he predicted correctly, he said, no, the newspapers are going to be all over, and the mainstream media are going to be all over the Michael Jackson trial. It's barely going to make a dent in the blogosphere. And that's exactly right. The blogs, what are you going to say about it? But newspapers, nonstop coverage. So it's, this is not simply um, an internet issue, but it is also. And so there are some techniques, and we hope there'll be more and more. There's a, um, Scott Rosenberg has a site called that you can Google, um, <laughs> where you can report newspaper bugs. It has the word bug in it. Um, you know, mistakes in newspapers is central clear. There are attempts to do it. None of them are going to succeed. We're going to be continually washed with uh, misinformation, lies, and, and the rest. There's nothing we, you know, ultimately, there's no way of eradicating that from the system, I don't think. It's, um, it's a little depressing. On the other hand, the one thing that we learned from it as we observe this is we're not really a rational species, and we shouldn't be expecting that we're going to be a rational species. We like, we, we like gossip. We like stuff that isn't true but sounds good. Uh, I guess I'll go around like that. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So some people are making the argument that this period of openness with the web and this sort of a blitz. Yeah. Woo would argue yeah. That it's going to get locked down. Yep. So the first question is, is the internet going to be shut down and turn into cable TV? Yes, unless you do something right now. As this is well on the way, and it may well be that we're taking the greatest chance for a democratized human renaissance of art and knowledge and spirit and turning it into cable TV for the benefit of Comcast, Verizon, and a few others. So support net neutrality. That's, uh, in fact, net neutrality is a, is a stopgap for the real thing, which would be structural separation. Yeah, no, this is incredibly depressing. Thank you so much for bringing this up. <laughs> and I, I actually. Your argument oh, so this, this is, I'm assuming that my argument here assumes that the net continues as what it is, but the net is unlikely to continue as what it is, so all of this was a waste of time. <laughs> oh, I'm so depressed. <laughs> yes, sir. Ah, okay, so there's two parts of this. This is Daniel Quinn, who I don't know. I'm sure I should. Um, I f have found over the past 10 years as I've been thinking about, about this, or uh, 10 years since I've been writing about it, but longer than that thinking about it, that I continually come back to a notion uh, that um, I don't entirely trust of mine. Um, it's not original with me. Um, that you have to explain why we leapt into this weird technology so quickly. Because the web is really, really weird. The more, you know, especially if you're old enough, you remember uh, everything about it is inverted from the real world. It's like a bizarro world. And yet people ha have run into it and embraced it with, with, with joy. And so you have to ask, why did we do that? And I, I have always thought in the back of my mind, that, and occasionally in the front of the mind, that one of the reasons that we did that is because it feels um, it clarifies ideas that we've always had, but that our previous media were unable to express. Um, an easy example is uh, the democratization of ideas, which has some terrible effects, and et cetera, because the bad ideas get in and the rest of it. Nevertheless, it's liberating. It feels liberating to have moved onto the web, especially as somebody who grew up without the web. 
moving into it felt liberating. What was it liberating? Old ideas that we all knew that were true, that people do have a great, that people are curious, that we want to explore as much of the world as possible. So much of our, especially younger educational system is predicated on a lack of curiosity. But we always knew we were curious, and we knew that we wanted to talk with one another and to connect. We knew that we were a social species. We knew that knowledge was always up for grabs and in debate and in dispute. And this was all stuff that we knew. And so the web felt like a liberation, and thus a return. Sometimes that's expressed as a return to a prior state, but it's actually an internal state or an internal awareness, I think. Um, so that was the first point. Ah, so um, yeah, I think you see this all over the place, but it, it's hard to notice sometimes because we get, this is the way in which the digital is affecting the real, um, because we get, um, it's the new normal and what normal is not, so it's sometimes hard to realize. Um, I'll give you one not very good example, which is um, stores are organized, physical stores are organized to use space against you. They put the well-known, right? They put the good stuff in the back, the popular stuff in the back to force you to walk by the end cap stuff, to see stuff that you didn't want in order that now you may want it. They make you wait, walk the length of the store. Websites don't do that. If they make you wade through stuff, even a single ad, you, you go somewhere else. We have gotten really used to genuinely customer-based sites that um, really take our needs first, and those are the ones that succeed. To some degree, you are beginning to see that in stores. And Staples is a particularly good example of it because they're doing it specifically, explicitly. They have thought, how can we make it, make it get customers in, in and out faster because that's what they want. Whether they succeed or not is a different question, but at least that is their operating, their operating philosophy. Um, increasingly, we, we, we will see things like that, that what we have come to expect on what we've come to expect from customer support on the web is affecting how customer support is done in the real world as well. In the post-capitalist context. Um, I would love to hear what you have to say about that to fill in my entire void on the topic. I, it's, it's a great topic, it's just not the way I think about things, so. Um, So how will all of this affect the early education system? And um, I, you know, my opinion on this is as valuable as my opinion on, on post-capitalism, but I'm going to express it anyway. Um, so our children went through very good public schools. Um, youngest is 20, so it's not that long ago. And they were still being told how many internet resources they could use to write a report. As if the internet is nothing but a source of, of misinformation. Um, and as if when they leave school, when they get, they need to know something, they are going to go to a physical library. But they're not. They're going to do what all of us do, which is to Google it or whatever. We're going to go on the web. Of course we are. So I, first thing is I would much rather see um, young students being told, assuming that they have access to the web. And there's a digital divide question here that's very important. Put that to the side. Um, that. Go, go explore and come back in with your web sources and let's talk about it as a class. Not three, but you're going to be doing, you are going to be seeking knowledge on the web. That's how it's done. It's the right way to do it. So bring it in and let's find out why the Stormfront biography of Martin Luther King, which for a long time was the number one hit at Google and is a white racist site, why maybe, how you can tell, what's the media literacy for that, you know, uh, so that maybe you can become. So that's, that's the first thing. But the second thing I think is going to be harder, which is we are still, 
if, it's, if it is in fact the case, as is my hypothesis, that knowledge's medium is the web, I don't think that's a radical hypothesis, by the way, but, and not books, that we actually look at the, the web, the network, as where knowledge lives, then you succeed by building knowledgeable networks, not simply by building smart people who can sit alone in a room and write a book. That's a good thing to do, too. But I, I would rather be training, teaching children to think collaboratively, to think together. Right now, the, the system is increasingly focused on individual testing. I, you know, I don't think that's how we build the next culture. I don't, th don't think that's how the next culture is going to work. The I believe, and I don't know, that the new generation of academics, for example, are going to succeed by being out in public, sharing their ideas, and ha creating, participating in, and being the nexus of webs of incredibly smart, passionate people who contribute, disagree, agree, uh, and build a network that has far greater value than any particular node has. It's not how our educational system is geared at the moment, but I think that's, what, what, that's how we're going to evolutionarily advance. Because skulls don't scale, but networks do. That's the hope for, for scaling knowledge. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's, so data.gov was almost shut, it was actually almost, I think, cut in half um, in the Republic, Republicans' initial budget. Yeah, that would have sucked. That was shocking. You know, I mean, it, that was shocking, especially since it's been, that model has been em embraced around the world. Uh, it, we would have been laughing stocks, not for the first time, but we would have been laughing stocks. All of this, so you're worried, uh, it's a tad ironic that you're worried, as you should be, that our precious information, knowledge will be um, therefore handed over to for-profit corporations locking it up, whereas the reason that's happening is that the, the non-for-profit organization can't manage to find the paltry funding for data.gov. Knowledge is at risk. Right? We don't have many institutions that are willing to step up and fund it, even when the funding, in some aspects, the funding is relatively minimal. There's some projects that would be expensive and wonderful to do, but some of it's just minimal. Just keep the damn data, will you? Put up a repository and let us access it and give us a search engine. It's not that hard. It's really not that expensive. So um, it, there aren't that many institutions that we can rely on. We, you know, we give our photos to Flickr and our, our tags to Delicious and it gets shut down and then it gets rebought as of yesterday or whatever it is. It's all at risk. Um, and the government can't be totally relied upon to do this either. I would suggest that there's one institution that is in a particularly good position. Yes, sir, I'm looking at you. One particularly good position to provide continuity of, of knowledge. The universities. Universities are going to be here for a long time. They're, they up and down, find out, sure, but you're not going away. Very, very few universities go away. This is something that universities could step up and do and say, yeah, this stuff counts. We can afford it. It's our mission. It's directly in line with our mission. And so let's do it. There are copyright issues that will kill everything. Another huge depressing topic like the end of the internet. Thank you very much. <laughs> in the back. Yeah, there's a guy all the way in the back. But um, we'll end very soon, but I, I promise I'll get to you. So uh, did you say memory institutions? Yeah, probably museums, libraries, archives, um, and maybe publicity if you're a place where knowledge is. So in the interest, uh, that's a great question. Where do these memory institutions, museums, and libraries, and universities fit? Um, 
I'm hoping that as they feel more and more under threat by the democratizing of what used to be their own domains, that they will step up and realize that they have an important future as exactly memory institutions. Uh, and I, in the interest of time, I'll just point you to, if you're not following the Digital Public Library of America stuff, DPLA, it's very interesting. There's a little hope there for libraries stepping forward and providing open access to our heritage uh, digitally. It's very interesting, DPLA. Uh, and finally, yes, sir. Uh, I have two questions on the first one. Uh, so you, at the beginning, you were talking about institutions being fragile, but a second ago, you were talking about universities being, you know, relatively, you know, being able to withstand any storm. So how do you mediate that? Um, so I had said that institutions are fragile, but universities can weather any storm. Right. Um, I'm not declaring all institutions are equally fragile and e equally the same way. Um, universe, newspapers as commercial enterprises are at risk. They could, they could go away. You know, I don't think anybody here would be shocked if in 10 years newspapers had crumbled. Universities for a variety of, of reasons, none of which I have any particular insight into, you, you know as well as I do, They're, we have a serious commitment to them and they are, they look to me to have some longevity. So in a way that uh, other institutions don't. So it's not something about institutions per se, it's institutions in the context of economics and all the rest of it. So. Well, on that note, on the longevity of institutions, <laughs> let's all um, thank. Uh, thank you very, very much. much.